Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Baram Brinidvam Bhadram Bo Yuya Me Nripanandana So Harde Na Prithag Dharmas Tushto Ham So Pridhenavaha The Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear sons of the King, I am very much pleased by the friendly relationships amongst you. All of you are engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I am so pleased with your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may ask a benediction of me. Purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Since the sons of King Prachini Bahishat were all united in Krishna consciousness, the Lord was very pleased with them. Each and every one of the sons of King Prachini Bahishat was an individual soul, but they were united in offering transcendental service to the Lord. The unity of the individual souls attempting to satisfy the Supreme Lord or rendering service to the Lord is real unity. In the material world such unity is not possible. Even though people may officially unite, they all have different interests. In the United Nations, for instance, all the nations have their particular national ambitions and consequently they cannot be united. Disunity between individual souls is so strong within this material world that even in a society for Krishna consciousness, members sometimes appear disunited due to their having different opinions and leaning toward material things. Actually, in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be two opinions. There is only one goal, to serve Krishna to one's best ability. If there is some disagreement over service, such disagreement is to be taken as spiritual. Those who are actually engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead cannot be disunited in any circumstance. This makes the Supreme Personality of Godhead very happy and willing to award all kinds of benedictions to his devotees. As indicated in this verse, we can see that the Lord is immediately prepared to award all benedictions to the sons of King Prachini Bahishat. The purpose of life is to please Krishna. To the degree Krishna is satisfied, our practice of devotional service is successful. We do not make spiritual advancement by impressing people, by becoming popular, by becoming very learned, by becoming very austere. True spiritual advancement can only be made when Krishna is pleased. Some Siddhir Hari Toshana. If Lord Hari is satisfied, our life is successful. And he is not simply seen through the eyes of people. He is seen through his own eyes, being situated within your heart. 
So Srila Prabhupada told us if we want to make spiritual progress we must be sincere. There are many ways of defining what is sincerity. One is that we very earnestly abide by the instructions of the spiritual master. That certainly is sincerity. But also it could be understood that sincerity means to be honest with the Paramatma within your heart who is the witness of your actions, your words, and your life, and your thoughts. Because according to how the Paramatma is satisfied, you're going to make progress. The spiritual master is called the external manifestation of the Paramatma in the heart. Yasya prasada, Bhagavat prasada, yasya prasada, nagati kuto. By pleasing Guru, we please Krishna. This means Shiksha Guru, Diksha Guru, all those who are actually taking us back home, back to God. Because the spiritual master is repeating the word of Krishna within the heart with the same intention. Therefore, Kaviraj Goswami prays, Bande Ham Sri Gurun. I first of all offer my obeisances to all my spiritual masters. In the conditioned state of consciousness, we cannot hear the voice of the Paramatma. Srila Prabhupada was very strong on this point. One time in a garden conversation, one devotee, very, very big book distributor, very senior devotee, he asked Prabhupada a question. He said, when we go out preaching, people say, I have no need for Guru because God is in my heart. Prabhupada said, why you are asking such foolish question? You are nonsense. Do you not read my books? Do you not know the answer? You are a rascal. You have simply come to give your spiritual master disturbance. Krishna tells us in Gita, Tesham satata juptanam bhajatam priti purapakam tadami buddha yogam tam yena mamupagantate. For those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, do I give intelligence from within. Everyone can imagine that God is speaking through their heart. So, the spiritual master, he is meant to be representing Krishna. Without such a spiritual master, any voice of the mind or the false ego can be interpreted as the voice of God within. There has been serial murderers who have killed many, many people. And they said that God ordered me to do this from within my heart. And when these people were brought to psychiatrists, clinically it was proven that he was actually convinced that it was God within the heart. But then he had to accept that God within the heart of the judge sentenced him to die. And so many devotees, they have these sentimental ideas that God within my heart wants me to do like this and he wants me to do like that. And so many deviations are coming. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada said, if you hear a voice within your heart, if it's the same thing your guru says, then you can accept it. If it's anything different, you must reject. It's not Paramatma. It's the mind. For a devotee, the mind disguises himself in the form of Krishna sometimes. Just like you have read in Krishna book about Pondraka. He disguised himself just like Krishna and claimed to be Krishna. And actually, he had a whole gigantic following of people who worshipped him as Vishnu. And he was telling them all the wrong things to do. In the name of surrendering to Vishnu, he was taking them all away from Vishnu. So, the mind is like this Pondraka. We should not trust the mind. If we put our faith in the mind, we will be disturbed. We must put our faith in God, who is within the heart, and who speaks through Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra the spiritual master, the great devotees, and the scriptures. This must be the foundation of our spirituality. So, King Prachini Barhishat, he had 
ten sons. They were known as the Prachetas. And this great king, even though he was quite materially attached, he was very religious minded. In fact, he was a descendant of Dhruva Maharaj. Knowing that his sons were meant to be great personalities with much influence in the world, he sent them to go to the forest to perform tapasya. This is very interesting, especially for those who are parents. He was living in royal palace with all luxuries, and he dearly loved his children. Out of his great love and affection, he wanted to give them the best. Therefore, he told them, leave the palace, go out into the forest to perform severe austerities. In the age of Kali, it may be difficult to give our children such advice, but we have to understand the principle that spiritual enlightenment is the purpose of life and real love is to guide our children on the path of devotion. So the Prachetas went deep into the forest and by their devotional practice they had darshan of Lord Shiva. Being pleased with them, Mahadev gave them mantra by which they could develop pure love for Lord Krishna. They chanted the song of Lord Shiva in glorification of Vishnu under the water for thousands of years. Through this process they became completely purified. And Lord Vishnu appeared to them on his beautiful bird carrier, Garuda, along with many, many of his associates. The first words that Lord Vishnu spoke to them are the verse that we are reading today. We will come back to this verse in a few moments because it is very, very important. It reveals how we can please Krishna. Not your opinion or my opinion, but Krishna's opinion. So, after the Lord congratulated them for their unity and their very, very deep commitment to the path of bhakti, he offered them any benediction. The Prachetas then worshipped Lord Vishnu with prayers of humility and love that, my Lord, out of your great, great compassion, you descend to this world to relieve the distress of your devotees. And how you bless those devotees who are very much attached to hearing and chanting your names and glories. Such devotees sanctify the entire world by their presence. There is only one benediction we desire. We want nothing of this world of birth and death. We only pray that in any situation we always have the association of those devotees who are very much attached to hear and chant your names and glories. Because it is only in that association that you are to be revealed. In this verse, of course, the Lord granted benediction. And then he told them all to get married. He said that the daughter of Kandu Muni, you should marry her. And you should have child. And I bless you that you could live for a million celestial years and enjoy great happiness in this world. But because you will do everything in my service, in the end you will return back home, back to God. You will not have the slightest attraction even for the pleasures of the heavenly planets. You will be completely immersed in my loving service. So the Prachetas, after worshipping the Lord with great humility, they came out of the water. And they saw that while they were gone, trees grew very, very high. 
In fact, the surface of the world was just covered with trees. They were reaching to the heavens. Potatoes became angry. And they began to breathe air and fire from their mouths. They were burning the trees to ashes. So Lord Brahma, who is the supreme environmentalist of the universe, <laughs> he descended and he <laughs> requested Prachetis that you should not disturb these trees. They are living entities. You should let them be. So immediately they accepted. And the trees being very grateful to the Prachetas, they presented their daughter to him in marriage. The story of their daughter is very interesting. There was a very great sage named Kandu Muni. He lived in a forest like we are sitting today. And he was so absorbed in meditation and penances and austerities. He was developing tremendous powers. So, heavenly kings were very much fearful that he was becoming too powerful. So they sent down a beautiful lady, an apsara named Pramlocha. And she appeared all alone in this secluded forest with Kandumuni. This is one of the dangers of trying to practice spiritual life alone. If he had some godbrothers with him, they would have said, Muniji, you know, she's Maya. And then they had child. And this child, a very beautiful little girl, baby. But Pramlocha, she did her job. She didn't want to stay with him any longer. Made him fall from his austerity, so she left. And Kandumuni, he completely detached himself, and he left. So Pramlocha left the little baby girl named Marisha in the care of the trees in the forest. And the trees are very compassionate beings, you know, but they had no milk to give the baby. So the baby was crying very, very loud. And then Soma, the Lord of the Moon, came to give nourishment to the child. And thus she was raised by heavenly people. So this girl Marisha married she was a very, very highly qualified, pure-hearted, devoted girl. And she married Prachetas. And later on, through her womb, a son was born. Does anyone know who her son was? You all know the person. Daksha. Daksha had previously been burnt by Lord Shiva for his offenses. He had his head cut off, and then the head of a goat was put on. But after he had his goat head, he became very humble. After all, there's nothing to be proud of if you have the head of a goat. And previously, he was so proud, he was making aparads to great Vaishnavas like Shiva. So he became very humble and begged forgiveness of Lord Shiva, and even performed yagya, and Vishnu descended and blessed him. So he took his next birth as the son of Prachetas and Marisha and assisted the Lord by being Prajapati. So in a very brief summary, this is the story that we are reading from of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now with your permission, I would like to concentrate our attention on the particular verse we are reading from today. What is spoken in Srimad Bhagavatam is not only for the individuals who are being addressed, but it is for all the world, for all time. 
This verse today is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead personally. He is explaining why he is revealing himself to the Prachetas. Why he is going to give them the ultimate perfection of life. Would we all like to know? Very important information. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear sons of the King, I am very much pleased by the friendly relationships among you. All of you are engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I am so pleased with your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may ask a benediction. Sometimes people consider that emphasizing friendly relationships is simply sentimental. We should speak philosophy. And when we're speaking philosophy about detachment, about the absolute truth, what do we care about friendly relationships? This is for lesser intelligence sentimentalists. Have you heard this before? So, actually, Lord Chaitanya was just chanting and dancing. And Prakashananda Saraswati and his followers in Varanasi, they were saying similar things. What is this chanting and dancing with so many common people? This Chaitanya is simply a sentimentalist. He should come with us and he should sit and study philosophy. Hare Krishna. But what is our philosophy? Samsadiradi Toshanam. Our philosophy is that the goal of life is to please Krishna. And that's the conclusion of our philosophy, to please Krishna. In Chaitanya Leela, there was just a simple lady named Duki, not educated, low birth. She just did some menial, manual, physical service. That's all she did. And because she was from such a low situation in her life, she was named Duki, which means miserable. But while the devotees were dancing and chanting in Kirtan at the house of Srivas, she, being a maidservant of Srivas, she would run to the Ganga and get pots of water and just bring them back and put them very nicely in lines so that when the devotees wanted to take bath, the water would be there for them to bathe. And she was doing it in such a way that nobody even knew she was doing it. Her idea was the water will just be there and they can bathe. They will not have to be inconvenienced by walking all the way to Ganga. And while everyone else was dancing and singing, Lord Chaitanya saw this. And he became very happy. He said, the name Duki, I do not like this name. It does not sit properly in my heart. On this day, I rename her Suki. Yeah. And with this name, which means happiness, he gave her the spiritual bliss of love of God. She achieved a perfection that all the big, 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 great, great scholars of Vanaris could not find. Because she simply wanted to please the devotees by humble service. So this is actually the conclusion of our philosophy. To be simple, to be humble, and to please Krishna through our devotional service. And herein Krishna explains what pleases him when his devotees have friendly relationships. So we have to be very, very careful in the way we understand this. In this age of Kali, the tendency is to misunderstand things by taking only one portion of a statement and then going to that extreme. How many of you have that experience? We take one part of the teachings and we go extreme that and we neglect the rest. 
So we have devotees who say that really we'll please Krishna by having loving, friendly relationships. But their loving, friendly relationships become very mundane. In fact, sometimes I have seen devotees, they go to some other religious group or some other yoga group or a New Age movement. And the New Age people, they embrace each other and they kiss each other and they just have so much friendly relationships with each other. They don't argue, they don't fight, because that interferes with their sense gratification. <laughs> and when you go to them, they're so nice to you. And they're willing to do so much projects just to help each other. Some groups, when you join their group, they'll build a house for you, they'll give insurance to you. If you ever get sick, they'll be running to help you with your medical bills. Everything is there. But if you discuss renunciation from sense gratification in such a group, they'll think you're a fanatic. They will say it's artificial to repress your natural needs. Therefore, we should be loving and friendly with each other to satisfy each other's mind and senses. Hare Krishna. And sometimes devotees are very much attracted to this type of asatsang. And they think, yes, these people must be higher than devotees because they like each other. No fighting, no politics. So this must be very good. So they may, to some extent, be in the mode of goodness. But because surrender to Krishna is not the heart of their relationships, it is all simply material. So this is sentimental idea, that we should just have friendly, loving relationships. Therefore, Lord Vishnu explains that he's pleased with the Purchetas because they have such loving, friendly relationships perfectly centered in devotional service to him. So this is one extreme, that we just should love each other and be friends with each other, and sadhana, and surrender to Krishna, and preaching. These things, we shouldn't be so fanatical about them. And the other extreme is, just do devotional service. Just surrender. You don't have time to talk to each other. And this friendship, it's all just emotional, sentimental garbage. Just surrender. Just do your service. So these are both extremes. And they are both wrong. Because the proper thing is balance. And this is what Lord Vishnu is explaining. We must make a major investment in developing proper relationships with devotees that is meant to inspire one another to go deeper in their bhakti. I'm sure many people come to this beautiful forest to sit under trees and develop nice relationships with each other. And that's exactly what we've come to do today. But the heart of the relationship is to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. In this chapter, Lord Vishnu says to the Prachetas, this is a very, very important verse. I would like to read it for you. This particular verse will solve all problems. Please listen attentively. This is the secret of unity spoken by Prachetas who have been empowered by the Lord. Whenever pure topics of the transcendental world are discussed, the members of the audience forget all kinds of material hankerings, at least for the time being. Not only that, but they are no longer envious of one another, nor do they suffer from anxiety or fear. In this material world, everyone is potentially envious of everyone else. Srila Prabhupada's purport explains the problem of material life. There is so much disunity in this world. 
And where there is disunity, everyone suffers. So there are so many projects to try to create unity. What is the basic problem of disunity? Everyone wants to enjoy. Everyone thinks, I am the enjoyer. And everyone's fighting over the facilities to enjoy. So this is the basic problem of material life, is everyone is thinking, I am the enjoyer. And that expands to, we are the enjoyers. My family, my religion, my race, my nation. You know, in this principle of selfish consciousness, there is crime, there is hatred, there is envy, there is terrorism, there is war. So to try to create a solution, Prabhupada explains, they have created the United Nations. But is there peace in the world despite United Nations? So many wars, so many imminent wars. So much conflict and mistrust, hatred. Because they have missed the point of what is truth. We have to unite on the principle that Krishna is the enjoyer. And we're all meant to be enjoyed by him. And Srila Prabhupada explains, if we have this selfish ego, even amongst devotees, there will be conflict and disunity. And in that environment, even in our Krishna conscious society, people will not really make proper spiritual advancement because they're not pleasing Krishna. Because there's arguments, there's politics, based on our own selfish desire. We want position. We want facility. And certainly we'll use it in Krishna's service. But actually, it is the mind and senses that are demanding service. And therefore, so much fighting and disagreement. Gossip and politics. And in Kali Yuga, people have such an incredible eagerness to hear gossip. When we give Srimad Bhagavatam class, people are very sleepy. But when we discuss devotees fighting or devotees falling down, people are wide awake. We like to hear the news. It's like there are websites on the internet that describe all kinds of gossip and rumors and blasphemies and who's done this and what scandals, historical references of problems. And probably the people, devotees, who have an eagerness to read these things, they never read Srimad Bhagavatam or quickly fall asleep when they do. But what does this all have to do with spiritual advancement? Prabhupada is warning us in this purport that selfish, egoistic desires destroy the propensity for bhakti. The only way we can actually establish real Krishna conscious friendly relationships is we have to strive to become pure. We have to strive for selfless devotional service. And we have to be willing to put aside our propensities for gossip, rumors, and selfish promotion to higher positions for the sake of serving others and help them become elevated. The nature of a devotee, on all levels, who is really understanding bhakti, is they don't want a high position. They just want to serve. And sometimes Krishna and the Vaishnavas put you in a higher position. And sometimes the devotee accepts it because that's the best way to serve. Even Raghunath Das Goswami, the Prayojana Guru, who teaches the highest principles of love of God, there's a beautiful prayer where he's praying that I don't want to be the friend of Krishna. I just want to be his servant. He's a manjari in the spiritual world, but this is his feeling. I have no qualification to be friendly with Krishna. I just want to be his servant, the servant of the servant of his servants. 
Every gopi simply wants to be the servant of the servant of the servant of Sri Radharani and see her enjoy with Krishna. Once I was in Vrindavan. I was praying at the Samadhi Mandir of Shamananda Goswami. And I was with another devotee. And a third devotee approached, and he had just read something that really confused him. He's reading about a particular gopi who's praying this way, and then Krishna is embracing her. So these gopis, if they are only thinking, I just want to be servant of the servant and have Sri Radharani embracing Krishna, then why are they embracing Krishna? And the answer was that the gopi only wants to see Radharani join with Krishna, but Radharani had Krishna embrace her because she's so pleased with this devotee. So she's not desiring this position of being embraced by Krishna. She's not aspiring for it or performing politics to get it. She just wants to take a very lowly position of being servant of the servant of the servant. But because Sri Radha Shamsundar are so pleased with her service, then Radharani tells Krishna, please embrace this devotee. So this is Raghunath Das Goswami's teaching. On the highest platform of Goloka Vrindavan, the gopis do not want to be friendly enjoyers of Krishna. They simply want to be servant of the servant of Sri Radharani. And because they have this selfless desire, they're actually forced to accept highest positions. And in this world, the same principle exists. Devotees should simply be trying to help inspire others to be elevated in Krishna consciousness. Try to be a servant so other devotees will become more and more dear to Krishna. And in order to have this consciousness, we have to be pure. Because this consciousness pleases Krishna. Therefore, we must be very strict. If we neglect our sadhana, we cannot develop proper relationships based in Krishna consciousness. It will be sentimental. We must do our sadhana very strictly, very attentively. And we want to serve devotees. We want to help devotees in every possible way to become more Krishna conscious. And we beg devotees to help us become more Krishna conscious. Devotees should feel an urgent need for each other's association for protection against Maya. If you're on the battlefield and the enemy is shooting at you and you're in the front lines, you only have a few people who are helping you in the battle. You absolutely need your comrades to survive. We have to take responsibility to protect each other from Maya. If you think you can fight the war against Maya alone, you are in great illusion. Prabhupada said anyone who thinks that he can be Krishna conscious without the association of devotees is insane. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, I'm lame. How will I walk this path of bhakti? It is only possible with the stick of the Vaishnava's mercy to hold me up. You see, our beloved Guru Charan Prabhu with this stick, that stick represents the mercy of Vaishnavas. We must take shelter of that stick. We must urgently understand our need for that stick. We desperately need each other. And if we become egoistic and do not have proper relationships centered around Krishna, whoever we are, it's just a matter of time till we may fall down. Prabhupada introduced transcendental competition. But the tendency is to take things wrong, to take the form without understanding the spirit. The form of competition is you should try to do more than someone else. But that can give a tremendous amount of justification to our false ego to become great and glorified. 
And even we pray to the deities, I hope somebody else does less, so I do more. But the spirit of competition is we're all trying to inspire each other to do more. And the end result is not that I'm the winner. The end result is everybody's working so hard in this spirit of competition. Everyone increases their service to such an extent that there's a wonderful offering to Guru and Krishna. Through this process, millions of books have been distributed. Thousands of devotees have heard the holy names. Beautiful temples are being built so that more and more people can come. And when people from all over the world are coming, then our united effort is what pleases Guru and Krishna. But even if we win, if in winning we have offended others, we have created envy amongst others, then you'll get nice maha plate and everyone will clap. But after some time you will fall down and then nobody will care about you. Srila Prabhupada said that you can show your love for me by how you cooperate with one another to serve my mission. He also said that the Krishna Consciousness Movement is based on love and trust. And if you read Prabhupada's Lila Amrita and hear of his biographies, the things that disturbed Prabhupada most was when devotees were fighting with each other when devotees were deviating from the pure principles of Krishna consciousness and when they were fighting with one another. Even to the extent of sometimes major, major programs doing incredible amounts of service, Prabhupada disbanded them because they created disunity. Some of the most major producing projects in the world because they were creating disunity because the real sustenance of our society is to the degree we develop friendly relationships on the basis of pure devotional service. The Prachetas, they were not fighting, they were not quarreling. They loved each other, they respected each other, they trusted each other. Each one was thoroughly confident that the others are my well-wishers. No false ego. And it was in this way that they were all chanting the mantra given by Lord Shiva. In the same way, if we are united, if we can tolerate our envious competitive urges, if we can put aside our desire for prestige, position, facilities, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he understood in Gaudiya Mat that the greatest danger of the Mat was egoistic fighting amongst each other for facilities and position. He spoke very strongly. He compared the prestige and glorification of others in this world to the stool of a boar. That's the worst stool. There are many varieties of stool, but hog stool is the worst, because what is hog stool? By scientific analysis, a hog eats stool, and that stool is transformed into another type of stool. When a hog eats a devotee's stool, they're very fortunate because that's transformed prasad. Hog stool is transformed stool. And of all hogs, the boar is considered low class. Very uncivilized, wild, lives in jungles. So, a very abominable stool. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati compared the desire for prestige to the most abominable of all forms of stool. And what kind of a personality enjoys eating that stool? Practically everyone in this world. They're willing to risk their spiritual lives, struggle like anything, just to taste the nectarine juices of that stool. Yeah, we should not want these things. We should want to serve. We should want to become pure. And we should want to become genuinely attached to the chanting of the holy names. 
genuinely attached to hearing and chanting the message of Vasudev. Genuinely attached to remembering Krishna. Intensely attached to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada and to perform these activities to please him. This was the mood of Prachetas. They worked together harmoniously to chant the holy names. And as they chanted the mantra of Lord Shiva together in this spirit, if we can create this loving service spirit amongst us, then when together we chant in Harinam Sankirtan, then Krishna will be very pleased to bless us and empower us. Srila Prabhupada wanted us to develop this type of culture of Vaishnava relationships so that we could come together in proper states of mind to chant the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Not so sleepy with enthusiasm. We should all try to enthuse each other by our enthusiasm to chant the holy names. Hare Louder, please. Louder, please. Keep doing like this, we will see the Lord come <laughs> and offer us benediction. Pure love of God. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. We heard that uh, the Prashadas, there were many hundreds, but today we are uh, talking only about ten. There were ten Prashadas. Huh? Yes. So many things we hear. Any other questions? Yes. Say that uh, sometimes we want to satisfy all the devotees and they have some needs, but we don't have the facilities to satisfy them always. So how we can uh, be friendly with them, even if we cannot uh, satisfy the needs, sometimes yeah. many needs? Yeah. This is a great challenge. But really satisfying devotees means satisfying their hearts. Not simply giving them material relief. To what extent we're able to give material relief, we should try to use that to serve devotees. But actually being well-wisher. Actually trying to inspire devotees. Trying to serve devotees according to our capacity. That will create a environment of love and trust. Even Lord Brahma cannot fulfill all the material needs of even one person. Because the mind that's not perfectly Krishna conscious, there's no end to what it wants. So we should just be in the proper consciousness of really trying to serve. And one of the best services is being a good example. Good example in your sadhana, good example in your eagerness to hear and chant and be a good example to really, really, you know, just try to do everything you can to help others become Krishna conscious. Our first concern should be for the devotees and next to the conditioned souls. They are both essential. It is our duty to reclaim conditioned souls on behalf of Guru and Krishna. Krishna tells us in Gita that preaching and serving his devotees is the most dear service to him. Ultimately, everyone's Krishna's devotees. Some are forgetful. But those who have made some endeavor to surrender Krishna are so very dear to Krishna. So you cannot be everything to everyone, but you can sincerely try to serve. And that will be the perfection of your life. Does that answer your question? Haribo. Any other questions? Sometimes when we forgive someone else, that because uh, that will create a, a credit for us if we are good and uh, forgiving 
towards another devotee, that means that in the future we will uh, act some uh, credit. Mm-hmm. Like the prior Jesus that was saying that you solve the debts of our other, like if you, I can't remember the prayer very well. Yes, to solve our debts, to get, we solve the debts of others towards another. So I want to know what to think about this. If uh, you know, about this state, if if it is good, even if we have this state of consciousness, uh, because we want some credit, spiritual credit, even we, if we are not completely genuine. Mm. So essentially, the question is: Should we do what's better, to do the right thing with the wrong spirit, mm. or the wrong thing with the wrong spirit? Mm. If we're going to quote Lord Jesus Christ. When they asked him, if a person offends us seven times, should we keep forgiving him? He said you should forgive him seven times seven. That means we should be willing to forgive anyone according to their injustices to us. Because essentially, if you don't forgive others for their trespasses to you, then you will not be forgiven for your trespasses to others. The ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam describes the foremost quality of a Brahmin is forgiveness. So we may say that I'm forgiving, but I'm forgiving because then other people will think I'm very, very advanced. But we can extend this idea to practically everything. That if I go to Mangalarti every day, people will think I'm advanced. So in order to be humble, I should not go to Mangalarti. <laughs> and if I chant my rounds every day, people are going to think I'm a strict devotee. So therefore, out of mercy and compassion to others, for the sake of preaching, I will not chant my rounds. <laughs> so the regulative principles, people are going to think that I'm a very nice devotee. So as an act of sacrifice and humility, I will go to the cinemas and go to the restaurants and let everyone know that I'm a fallen soul. So we have to do the right thing. But if we want to make the proper advancement, we have to do it in the right spirit. We do the right thing, and even if we have the wrong spirit, we should do it with the intention of trying to strive and struggle for the right spirit, and gradually we'll become purified by those actions. Ultimately, whatever motives you have, by engaging in any of the processes of devotional service, you're becoming purified. However, if you have the wrong motives and they force you to act in the wrong way, then part of your purification may be to fall down and suffer. So even if we do not have the right desire, we should be praying and longing for the right desire. And this becomes natural when we hear. When we hear what our consciousness should be, then we examine our consciousness in our service and we see the anartas and we don't serve them. We try to overcome them. If we're not hearing these subjects in the association of devotees, then we even know that something's an anarta and we'll try to be striving to fulfill those anartas. Let us say two devotees are worshipping the deity. One dresses the deity on Wednesday and the other on Thursday. And they both have anarchas within their hearts. One is dressing the deity with the ambition to satisfy his anarchas. He wants to be known as a very, very great, famous pujari. He wants the whole world to think, nobody dresses Krishna like me. No doubt that person should keep dressing the deity, because eventually, directly or indirectly, he'll get purified of this desire. But the other devotee on Thursday, he's dressing the deity the same way. But his motivation is by doing this service to purify himself from all these anartas to want to be famous and want to be glorified and wanted to get all kinds of material benefits. So who is more pleasing to Krishna? Does everyone agree that the second devotee is more pleasing to Krishna? So who will become purified quicker? Who will make more spiritual advancement? It's very simple. Whatever our motives, we must continue our devotional service. But when we submissively hear Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, we understand what consciousness we should do our service. 
we're will, able to discriminate between what is maya and what is devotion. And we strive for the higher principle to please Krishna. And what will please Krishna most? When there is unity and purity. Or according to this verse, when we develop friendly relationships based on service for the purpose of purifying our hearts and rendering something wonderful that will please Krishna jointly. I saw an article in a newspaper of one of the very, very top athletes in sports in America. And he was in a particular game where in this game he could have made a world historical record for how many points he scored in the game. And with the last few seconds of the game, he had the ball, and he could have scored. But he passed the ball to another player. <laughs> he passed the ball to another person, and that other person scored. And at the last moment, they won the game. And everyone was really confused. If you would have thrown the ball and made the shot, you would have won the game and you would have made a world record. Why did you give it to somebody else? He won the game, but he didn't make any world records. And this athlete, he was very serious. He said, when I'm playing, my only ambition is that the team wins. I don't think in any way about what records I make. Ninety percent, I could have made that shot and won the game and made the record. But that other player was in a better position to shoot. Perhaps ninety-five percent. So I have to do what's best for the team, not what's best for me. That is the mentality of champions. And that's a mundane athlete. So what should our position be? We should work for the team, not for ourselves. Otherwise, he would have won world record. He would have been gone down in history, but the team would have lost, perhaps. There was a risk that the team may lose for that, so he didn't consider himself. And although this person had so many world records, he said, I never wanted one. I just tried to do what's best for the team. This is the way Srila Prabhupada wanted Iskand to be, but with spiritual motive. Krishna is most pleased when we all succeed. Krishna is most happy when as a group, as a society of Vaishnavas, we can render the greatest service. Does that answer the question? Yes, Prabhu, how do you all? But the Peter you said that uh, if we work on uh, ourselves, we can uh, forgive one person that in one way or another offended us. But uh, the main, the most difficult thing is to forget, and because sometimes it's difficult to to forget you know, what people have done to us and to um, come back, forgive, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, to go back to the same uh, relation uh, like before. It may or may not be possible to go back to the same relation as before. And it may be very difficult to forget offenses that have been committed to us. But a devotee sees through the eyes of Scripture. When a devotee is abused, he sees that actually it's not this person doing this to me. It's Krishna. He's returning my past karmas to me. Because I have abused others, therefore I have to be abused. It's the laws of nature. And this person is just like the postman delivering my debts. So in that way, we shouldn't be so angry with him as we should understand that it is my fault. And if you forgive the person and thank Krishna, then you're completely purified of your past sins. But if you retaliate, 
and offend him, then instead of being purified, you're just perpetuating another sin. Bhakti is a science. We must understand these things philosophically. Our everyday life has to be practiced philosophically. Sometimes if someone's lying against us, you have the right to explain what is the truth. That is right, but it should not be done in a malicious way. Shivas Thakur, Gopal Chapala, wanted to defame him by putting the articles of Tantric Puja in front of his house. But Srivas was so extremely humble. Instead of coming out and telling the public, I didn't do this, somebody else did it. He said, I've come to inform you that this is really what I do. But because he was so humble that all the sincere people, they didn't believe him. They just took it all away and washed his yard with cow dung. Well, sometimes our relationships are disturbed. And if it is within our power to repair it, we certainly should, because the unity amongst Vaishnavas is what gives the power to our society, both individually and collectively. So we should strive to live by this principle to our capacity. And if we do so, we'll make great spiritual progress. Because we will please Krishna. Trinada pisuni chena torora pisuhishnana amanina manadena kirtaniya sadhari If we live by this principle, no problems. By external standard, there will always be problems as long as we're in this material world, devotee or not, always problems. But there'll be no problems in our spiritual advancement if we live by this principle. To strive to be humble like the straw in the street, tolerant like tree, ready to offer all respect to others and expect none in return. We have to actually keep checking ourselves because Maya puts many traps before us, irresistible traps. Because only in this spirit can we really chant the names constantly. Many, many years ago, a Rishi told me something that I think applies to Krishna consciousness also in certain ways. He said two things we should forget. Any good things we've done for others, we should forget it. Because it will make us proud. And any bad things ever done to us, we should try to forget it. Does that harmonize with Krishna consciousness? And two things we should always remember. One, that death could come at any moment. And two, that the holy name is our only salvation. As you're walking, see how tolerant the trees are? As they're giving you shade. You see these trees? Right now the sun is burning in the sky. The August sun in Italy is very hot. These trees are standing directly, being burnt by the sun. But in doing so, they're giving us shade. So we can sit in a very, very cool comfortable position without the hindrance of the sun's burning heat. How much they're tolerating inconvenience just to serve us, to give us convenience. Devotees should be like this. And as you were walking, how many blades of grass did you step on? Did you offer your obeisances to each blade of grass? Did you look at each grass and say, Prabhu, please accept my obeisances. You are very nice. <laughs> Without even considering their existence, you just stepped on them with your feet. And yet the grass is very satisfied just to be there to give softness to your feet. Vaishnav should be like that. Humble like a blade of grass. And today we saw Bhaktin Kurma Devi, very nice tortoise. Krishna sent her. 
to teach us a good lesson. As soon as Mukundananda Prabhu picked her up, she became afraid. And how did she express her fear? That the only way a turtle knows how to protect herself by withdrawing her hands, her legs, and her head, and her tail, everything within the shell. And she wouldn't come out. Even they were shaking and everything, but as long as she was in Mukundananda Prabhu's hands, she would not come out. Her limbs were tightly drawn within that shell. The Bhagavad Gita tells us that as the tortoise withdraws its limbs within the shell, the devotee withdraws his senses from their objects. Why? Because if we don't, we have no protection. We will fall down. Therefore, when the objects of the senses come before us to make us fall down, we have to withdraw our senses as the tortoise withdraws its limbs within its shell. Very important lesson. That tortoise has become one of our gurus. Srila Prabhupada Ki Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.